In this video, we're going to learn about the final experiment of the three that helped us determine our modern conception of the atom, and to that we go to Danish-Jewish physicist Niels Bohr, which is indeed the same Niels Bohr of which Bohr-Rutherford diagrams are named, and this particular experiment is actually his primary contribution to our knowledge of atomic and electron structure and why the diagram is in fact named after him. So Niels Bohr's experiments were primarily involving hydrogen, but the principle behind this experiment can actually be applied to any other element on the periodic table. Uh, and what Niels Bohr did is he applied an outside energy source, uh, which we can do in regular labs just by heating an element, and allowed this energy to strike the atoms of the element that he was studying. Now, when this happens, the electrons in the valence shell are going to be exposed to this energy first, and the electrons in the valence shell are going to absorb this energy that comes from an outside source, uh, which again can be something as simple as heat from a fire. Now, this energy from the heat source outside of the element is going to be absorbed by electrons within the valence shell and is going to cause at least one of the electrons in the valence shell to jump from the valence shell to a higher energy level. Now, remember that each of the shells of a Bohr-Rutherford diagram simply represent the amount of energy that an electron has. The more energy it absorbs, the farther it is able to move away from the nucleus, and because of the fact that these electrons have more energy due to this energy absorption from the outside source, this is what we call the excited state of an electron, and we can see here that the electron now exists in a higher energy level or a shell that is farther away from the nucleus than the one that it started in, that being its valence shell. The problem is that if the energy source that is supplying this electron with the energy that it needs to get to the excited state is removed, that means that there is no energy input that is keeping this electron in the excited state, which means the electron is not going to be able to stay in the excited state here. Now, Niels Bohr knew this and realized that because energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed, this is simply the law of conservation of energy, he realized that when this electron returns to its original position in the valence shell, the energy that it absorbed must be released in some way, because this energy that the electron absorbed cannot ultimately be destroyed, so it must be released back into the environment when this electron returns to its original position. So the original position that this electron had is what we call the ground state, which refers to the position of the electron within its valence shell as long as there is no energy input from outside of the reaction. But what Niels Bohr was interested in is the energy that is released when the electron returns from the excited state back to the ground state. And this extra energy, not only did Niels Bohr observe that the amount of energy being released was constant for a specific atom, but that it was constant for every element that he tested. For example, if he heated a helium atom, the energy that would be released by helium would be the same every single time. Likewise with lithium, sodium, etc., each element would release a specific amount of energy every time Niels Bohr repeated this experiment, and for that he coined the term fluorescence. Now, fluorescence is a form of light where after an electron 
is jumped to its excited state when the energy source that causes the electron to jump to the excited state in the first place is removed, that electron is going to return to the ground state and the extra energy that was absorbed by that electron released outward is what we call fluorescence. And as mentioned previously, this is actually an experiment that you can do even from the comfort of your own home if you have access to pure samples of specific elements. For example, if we do this fluorescence test by burning copper, all that you need to do is light some fuel such as lighter fluid on fire uh, and put a piece of copper metal within that fire and just as the flames are about to die down, you will see the fire turn green and this color change is the release of energy that copper's excited state electron releases before returning to the ground state and if you do this with lithium it presents this beautiful ruby red flame which is my personal favorite of the fluorescence tests to do so the conclusion that niels bohr uh, realized through this fluorescence experiment is that electrons absorb and release energy or the electrons that absorb and release energy are farthest from the nucleus which just makes sense because the energy that is hitting the atom is going to hit the valence electrons first and therefore the valence electrons are the ones that are going to jump to the excited state and therefore each element fluoresces uniquely meaning that each element releases a different amount of energy during the fluorescence process because each element has a different number and organization of electrons. And this is how Niels Bohr ultimately developed the model of the Bohr-Rutherford diagram and of the quantum model that we still use to this day. However, as we'll explore in the next video, even Niels Bohr's model of the atom and of the organization of electrons within the atom has quite a few problems which we can actually analyze by looking at the properties of electrons themselves, and that will be the subject of the final video in this series.